When I was in college, I knew for sure that I wanted to go to law school. In fact, I was determined because it was obviously my passion. Growing up, I, all I wanted to do was become a voice to the voiceless. I wanted to fight for women's rights and human rights and civil rights and things like racism enraged me and I knew that I needed to dedicate the rest of my life to fighting for those causes. At the suggestion of my uncle Fred, while I was in college, he said, you know, you should try doing a couple internships to see what the practice of law is versus the study of it. And I was like, you know, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. So I set on this mission over the next four years of my undergraduate to do every single internship under the sun. I interned at the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights on Capitol Hill. I did an internship at the White House. I worked at private firms. I worked at Baha'i-based firms. I talked to every single person that I admired and loved. And at the end of it, I was left completely disenchanted because I couldn't see how I could wake up every day for the rest of my life and do that. So I became severely depressed because I felt like I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was depressed because, more importantly, I didn't know myself well enough to make the decision of what I wanted to do. And I had just gone through this whole thing of spending all my mom's hard-earned money on LSAT applications, I mean LSAT courses and law school applications. And everybody had this idea of me as like, this is what Melody is going to be. And I felt like I was failing them, which is probably really selfish in hindsight, but that's what it felt like. So when I was depressed, a friend of mine recommended that I speak to this woman. And she was like, this woman um, is really good at mirroring people, so you should have a talk with her. And I was like, sure, I'll do anything. So I spoke to this woman, and in the hour that I spoke to her, she mirrored me back in such a way that I had never been mirrored before. And I felt for the first time in my life, at the age of 24, that somebody had finally seen me. And so there was a part of this that was incredible, but then there was also a part of it that was the most terrifying thing on the planet. Because somebody had said out loud all the things that I thought I was, but that nobody had ever confirmed. So I, um, she brought up this quote, actually, by um, Baha'u'llah that says, regard man as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. I knew that I had a gift in design, and I knew that I had this gift my entire life. But like many other kids, um, you know, we would hope that our parents and our teachers up to a certain age mirror us and let us know, like, hey, you're really good at this. You're going to be something. Or you would think that they would, you know, mirror these things back to you. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen because our parents are used to doing this thing that makes you want to be safe, right? So they just want the best for you. It's really out of the best intentions ever, but they want what's best for you. So I read this quote, regard man as a mind rich in gems of inestimable value, and I was like, oh, we all have these gems of inestimable value, but it is our responsibility to mine those gems. And so I set out on this mission of wanting to mine my own gems. And as I was doing this, I realized that I was going up history. I was going up against history. And I had to go up against every single generation of women in my entire family that hadn't had the opportunity to do what they wanted to do. And so I had all these voices that were coming at me that were like, you can't do that. It's not safe. Don't go there. A woman isn't supposed to do that. And as I searched deeper, I realized that there was even more hidden language. Like, one thing that was most shocking to me is that my value lied in who I married. So the general thing that I'd keep getting back to me is that it's more valuable for you to be Mrs. Doctor, blah, 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 than for me to become my own doctor. So once I realized this, I started to question everything. I really felt like for the first time in my life, I had become a student of life. And I even started to question God, because I was like, really? Why would you, why would you do this to me? So <laughs> um, I realized that the idea I had of God was very much my mom's, because 
our mom is our first creator, right? We live in them, we come out of them, and generally they're the first ones that we identify as the creator. So I became like one of these um, students like in the Kung Fu films that are like on Shaolin Mountain, like, you know, going crazy every day. And I decided that I was going to present three questions to God and that I would demand answers. And if God existed, that he would answer my questions. So every single morning and every night, I would wake up and I would plead with God. And I'd say, show me what you look like to me, to me. I want to know who you are to me. Connect me to you as you are, not as what I think you are. And show me my path because I don't know. Show me. So at the end of this, I did receive many answers. And my life changed greatly because for the first time in my life, even though my entire life I had prayed and I thought I was spiritual and I had a connection, I felt like for the first time I really got to know God. And I, like I said, I learned many things, but the one thing that I learned more so than anything is that God is the ultimate resource. The ultimate resource. And I know everybody's like has this like hippy dip thing of like God is good all the time, God is everything. But to me, it was like, no, God is gonna be my business partner, He's gonna be my father, He's gonna be my mother. God is truly the ultimate resource. So I knew that if I maintained that relationship above anything else, that every day I would wake up and I'd remember who I am and exactly why I'm here. So around that time, too, it just so happened that there was a lot of these like new age practices and things coming out, and The Secret had come out around that time. And I don't know how many of you saw the movie or read the book, but it was this huge phenomenon among my friends. And the one thing that I realized that The Secret lacked was the will of God. So of course, the laws of attraction are true, and we all believe in them, and they do exist in the world. But what if I want a huge house and I make a vision board and I'm like, I attract it and I get this huge house, but what if that house takes me out of my purpose? What if that house now is a burden because I'm working overtime just to maintain this house? So you see, it's really, really important to have that connection first because we don't know what's good for us. We know what we think is good for us but we need to have that connection in order to, you know, live a truly authentic life. And, you know, at the time I, I spoke to my aunt who lives in Uganda, and she was like, Melody, if you came here and you told people that there's a pill that you take that makes you happy, she's like, people would laugh at you. And I was like, Amifu, what do you guys do? What do you mean? And she was like, if somebody here is sad, everybody in the village gets together and sings until they're happy again. And then she said, she's like, what do you think people in a country like this do that have no resources? She's like, we don't have water or electricity on a constant basis. She's like, what do you think we do? Think about that when there are no resources. She said, four elders from the tribe go out into the field when there's a drought and they pray to the ancestors for rain, and it rains. The ancestors, God, Jah, Allah, Jehovah, I don't care what you want to call it, but they know that they have this access. So in America, I feel like we've really forgotten about this connection, the most great connection that we have to this, the greatest resource that could ever present itself to us. And instead, we're... We look for everything outside of ourselves. We're the largest consumers of pills, so many pills, marijuana. I mean, there's weed everything now. And all we do is this topical numbing things that just take us out of who we are versus going in. At the same time, around that time, I um, read this quote by Abdul Baha. And he said, it is an axiomatic fact that while you meditate, you are speaking with your own spirit. In that state of mind, you put certain questions to your spirit, and the spirit answers. The light breaks forth, and reality is revealed. 
in that same quote, he also goes on to say that through it, inventions are possible and things that man knew nothing about are presented to him. And I was blown away by this quote because I was like, what do you mean I put questions to my own spirit and it answers? Like the light breaks forth. I was like, what does that mean? And why would the prophet of God say this if it wasn't true? So with the help of Kathy Grammer, who was one of my greatest mentors, she taught me how to meditate. And I started off doing guided meditation. And through the process of guided meditation, I did exactly this. I presented questions to my spirit, and my spirit would answer in the form of wake dreams. So I started off really simple. I would ask about attributes that I was interested in. So for example, I'd ask about purity. I'd be like, show me what purity looks like. And I would come out of meditation, and I'd be like, whoa, I had no idea. And it was really as if I was putting questions to something that was higher than me, and that higher, clear thing was answering. Once I learned that I had access to myself in this way, then I finally developed the conf confidence and assurance that I needed to go up against any type of inertia that presented itself to me, including my history including all the myths that people told me that I knew weren't true. Like, you have to pay your dues. Who made that up? What if I'm just it? Why do I have to pay my dues? So I literally started to question everything. And around this time, it was also when I started to become fascinated with nature. Because I realized that fa nature is really a true mirror of our existence here. So I was like, what if everybody in the world was as authentic as nature? So like animals, the only difference between us and animals is that we have free will and the ability to reason, right? So a squirrel isn't trying to be at the beach because a squirrel knows that it belongs in a tree and with a walnut, and that's where it's happiest. If it were at the beach, it would be miserable. But I feel like... We have so many squirrels at the beach in our world because people aren't asking themselves the true questions of like, who am I? What makes me happiest? Where do I belong? And they're not asking them authentically. They're saying, what's my role? What's my role? But they're not going in to figure it out. So um, Julie Burns Walker says this quote of, Love is the only nutrient in the world that can be expressed. Think about that for a second. Love is the only nutrient. So I can express a nutrient to you. So this is something that I try to practice its expression in the best way possible. And I want to say, as so many have echoed before me, that love isn't this like hippy dip, esoteric thing that that just is out here, that exists between men and women, or it's not something that's so small. Love is the most powerful thing in the world. And love is the only way, the only way that you can gain memory of who you are. It's only through doing things that you love that you can remember who you are. So if you love running, you need to make time to run every day because I promise you, if you strap on your shoes and go take that run, that you're gonna have a conversation with somebody or there's gonna be a thought that comes over you or there's gonna be some special sign there that's just for you, that reminds you of who you are. And just in the same way, forgetfulness is equally as much of a practice. I mean, I am a total victim of Instagram and I get into these black holes on Instagram sometimes where I'll end up on like Kim Kardashian's page or something. And after 30 minutes of scrolling on her page, I'm like, do I need a waist trainer? Like, <laughs> maybe I need that teeth whitening thing. That she... And it's nothing against her. I think she's a beautiful, incredible person. But I know that there's nothing there for me. There's no memory there for me of who I am. There's nothing there that makes me remember or that inspires me of who I am. It makes me forget. So I have to go in the way of things that I love. Instead, I'll go on Hermes's website and watch how they make, um, how cobblers make 
leather gloves by hand, and after that I'm like, ooh. Or <laughs> I watch videos of Prince performing where the man is so inhabited in himself that even with eyeliner and a perm and heels, I'm like, damn, he's hot. <laughs> because he has completely inhabited himself. And that's the direction in which I need to go because that makes me remember. And every single day on this planet, we are faced with forgetfulness. Every single day we forget who we are. So the responsibility to remember is the most important. So there is this, um, one, one of the other things that really causes me to remember who I am is Lauryn Hill's Unplugged album. It's probably my most played album of all time and she drops many gems in there, but I'll leave you with this. There's all this social doctrine that says that the infinite God with all his expression who created every single one of us absolutely different, wants everyone to, face, to fit into the same suit. That's deception. And I put the fingerprint there because there's five billion of us on this planet, and each one of us has a different fingerprint. Isn't that testament to God's design, that we were each created completely and beautifully different? And it is our absolute responsibility to figure out who we are and why we're here and each one of us contains a special remedy to all the world's ills if we should choose to step up to that. Thank you.